Dr. Michael Rothberg, welcome back to Plant Yourself Podcast. Hey, so great to be here. Yeah, so, so we talked, I thought it was like a month ago, but it was actually like five months ago uh, in March um, yeah. about what we knew about COVID and what we didn't know. And I hope that there's more things that we know now. We know so much more now than we knew then. It's, it's really, it's great how much more we know, and it's surprising in some ways how little things have changed. Okay, because I don't feel like I know more. I feel like I've just gotten more confused about every topic from aerosolization to herd immunity to hydroxychloroquine to vaccine. So whatever's, either I'm doing a bad job or whatever's coming out <laughs> in the media is, is just making things worse for ordinary people. So I would love to, uh, to find out what we actually no. So, t so t what's one thing that we know now that, that you think is really significant that we did not know in March? Yeah. So what we, what we know now is that uh, transmission through the air is an important means of transmission, maybe the major means of transmission. So, you know, back in March, we really didn't have any idea about how COVID was spread. We knew maybe it could spread on surfaces. We knew it could live on surfaces for a long time. And so that was why all the emphasis on washing your hands. Um, there was not so much emphasis on wearing masks, at least in the United States. But now we have a much better understanding that masks are really crucial for reducing the spread, um, particularly when people are together indoors. Um, and so um, that's, that's one thing that we know. Another thing that we know is about asymptomatic spread. And I think that really, we didn't have any idea about that in March. But somewhere around probably 40% of the people who get infected with COVID are asymptomatic. So they, they really don't, they, they don't display pretty much any symptoms, but those people do spread virus and they spread it through the air. So uh, you could be with somebody who feels totally fine. And if you're in close proximity to them for some period of time, you're going to, you know, you are at risk for mm -hmm. contracting. Okay, and, and what, so yeah. for, for that one, like how, how do we know that? What are, what are the types of studies that are done? Um, so those are actually done from, um, you know, a combination of uh, kind of epidemiologic uh, stuff, sort of tracing where people got the virus from. And then uh, when they have people that tested positive who were uh, not symptomatic, right? So if you're, if you, if you catch somebody who has the disease and then you do contact tracing, which is find all the people that came into close contact with them mm -hmm. and then test those people to see whether they have the disease, you know, whether they test positive. Some of those people who are gonna test positive don't have symptoms, but you test them anyway to find out if they, if they have it and they need to be isolated. So once, you, once you've identified some of those people, then you can do tests to see whether, you know, how and, and uh, whether they're spreading the virus. Uh, is that largely done by computer modeling to say, let's, let's assume that they don't spread and let's assume that they do, and then which one maps better onto the, the, number, the data we have? No, that's, that's actually done by, by epidemiologic tracing. So let's say you, you actually come down with the disease mm -hmm. um, and let's say that there were few enough people in North Carolina that they actually could do contact tracing. Um, the reason we haven't been doing contact tracing in the United States is that we're totally overwhelmed. There are so many cases that it's just not possible to have someone call everybody that you came in contact with in the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're generally not doing much contact tracing. But if we went in the cases where we do contact tracing, they would call everybody who came into contact with you and then urge those people to go get tested. And so some of those people would get tested and would test positive and they'd have no symptoms. So that's how we would discover that those, that there were people who had no symptoms uh, mm -hmm. and who have the disease. The next thing would be, okay, then you could do tests where you have them breathe out and see whether you collect virus particles. Mm -hmm. So we find out, are they, you know, capable of spreading the virus. Um, and that's what we discovered is yes, they are capable, you know, when, when they breathe, there are virus particles that are coming off of their breath. Um, and so, yeah, so there's, it's, it, yeah. Okay. People, people uh, can spread it and, 
and it's probably something like 40% of the, of the cases are people who are asymptomatic. So that's a, that's a really important piece that we learned. And that really, you know, plays into two things. One is the importance of wearing masks. Uh, so you can have the virus without knowing it. And the only way that you can protect the people around you is by wearing a mask. And I think there's been a lot of misunderstanding about the, the role of masks in, in the pandemic. The role of masks is not to protect you, it's to protect the people around you. But if we all wear masks, then we are all protected. So if I'm wearing a mask, I'm protecting you because I'm not breathing on you. If you wear a mask, then you're protecting me because you're not breathing on me. Mm -hmm. we're, we're both being protected by each other. But if I don't wear a mask because I say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a freedom loving individual and damn it, you can't tell me to wear a mask. I'm just going out and endangering everybody around me. It's not about me being cavalier with my own health. It's me being cavalier with the health of the other people. So, so that's the importance of, that, that's, that's what asymptomatic mm -hmm. spread tells us about the importance of wearing masks. The second thing is that asymptomatic spread really means that we need contact tracing to be able to really, uh, to, to really stop the spread of the virus because we can't just take symptomatic people and isolate them. We need to find all the people who are infected and isolate them. Mm. Is there something that could be crowdsourced? It seems like when you talk about, you know, like the government or the health agency can't call all the people I've been in contact with in two weeks, but I could. Uh, you could, yeah. Um, it, I mean, Contact tracing could be done where individuals would, would call. Contact tracing can most easily be done with phones. Um, but, you know, in the United States, we're not comfortable with that. I mean, you know, early on, they developed apps that would allow you to do contact tracing with your phone. Um, but they just haven't really been employed. I don't know why, um, but I think it really has to do with, you know, just our total obsession with, with privacy and our fear about people knowing where we are and what we're doing. That's, <laughs> which that's is, a which uniquely is, American uh, kind of position. You know, people in other countries don't fear their governments as much as we fear ours. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's so ironic. Like Facebook and Google know where I am every minute of the day. Presum you know, presumably they're listening in as well yeah. <laughs> based on the ads that I get after having conversations during my morning runs <laughs> when, I, when my phone is on airplane mode. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. but, but people are very uncomfortable with that. So we haven't done contact tracing. At, at this point, you know, it's so widespread that contact tracing is, is probably not where we you know, that, that's sort of an end game kind of thing. When you're down to a limited number of cases, mm -hmm. you, you find all the people around those cases and you quarantine them. And then you wait until, you know, they don't, until you know that they don't have disease before you send them back out into the population. That's how you, you know, that's the end game for the, the, uh, the pandemic. But we are so far away from that. We just have widespread disease everywhere. So, you know, contact tracing is somewhere in our future. Gotcha. Um, so talking about masks, I mean, I'm still hearing from medical doctors, from people that, you know, masks are dangerous, masks don't work. I, like, like, let's not spend time talking about that unless you think there's any validity to any of those claims. Yeah. So again, I think it's a confusion about what the mask is supposed to do, right? So if the mask, if you think of the mask as trying to protect yourself, the kinds of masks that we have are not very effective. If you think of the mask as trying to, you know, uh, to protect other people, then the mask is effective. It's kind of like, you know, I, I saw a cartoon about this trying to explain it on Twitter. You know, it's like, if you're wearing pants, you know, and you try to pee on me, it's effective in keeping you from peeing on me. If I wear pants and you try to pee on me, that's not effective to keep me from getting wet, right? <laughs> and so that's, that's really what we're talking about is we're talking about wearing pants to protect the other people. And that requires a sort of a level of, of um, you know, altruism and respect and caring about other people in your society. And we just aren't there right now. 
Mm. Although most people do wear pants, so. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I just saw a study out of out of Duke about different kinds of masks. Do you have a have a sense of uh, if you have a recommendation? Is there a baseline level of protection that? Yeah, you know? so that's actually interesting. Um, so. Um, Again, you know, you have different kinds of masks. The most effective masks are the N95 masks, but those things are hard to wear and they're really uncomfortable. Um, so I don't think it's, it's certainly not necessary for people to wear N95 masks. Those are really, those are for self-protection. So mm -hmm. that's what medical personnel are wearing when they're in, a, you know, if you're working in an ICU, working with patients who have COVID, you need to have you know, total protection of the air that's coming into you. Mm. But you don't need that in order to protect other people um, from you. So N95 masks really aren't necessary. Um, paper surgical masks are great. Those are probably the, the, you know, the highest level of protection. And they're not hard to get now. Um, you know, you can buy them in Costco and they're like, you know, a box of, uh, I don't know, a box of 50 or 100 is like 20 bucks. So it's, it's not, you know, there's no real excuse for people not having masks. Um, and um, so, so that's like the highest level of protection. If you prefer a cloth mask, um, it should probably have several layers of cloth, um, you know, and then uh, the worst seems to be this, uh, you know, the, the, the neck thing where you pull it up and down. That doesn't uh -huh. seem to be very effective. Um, the, the last thing though, I think that's also really important is you'll see these masks that have a valve in them. And the idea of the mask with the valve is it lets the air vent out, but it doesn't let the air vent in. So it's mm. easier when you're breathing out, you're less likely to get your glasses fogged up and whatever. That totally defeats the purpose of the mask. The purpose mm -hmm. of the mask is not to vent the air out. It's to prevent the air from going out because you wanna to try to protect the people around you. So again, if you understand the purpose of the mask, we are all wearing it for each other. Um, it's just, you know, it's just common courtesy. It's respect for the people that, you know, for your neighbors, for the other shoppers, for the people working in the store. Um, and you should wear the mask for that reason. But okay. so I would avoid the ones that have the that have the valves in them because they're not doing what you want it to do. Mm. So the valve is like walking around with pants and your fly unzipped. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, what a, what have we learned about uh, treatments? Does that, does anything work? Um, so not much. Well, no. So we've learned a lot. Uh, we've learned what doesn't work. Hydroxychloroquine does not work. Azithromycin does not work. And people should not take those. Um, hydroxychloroquine doesn't work for patients who are very ill. It doesn't work for patients who are moderately ill, and it doesn't work for patients who are mildly ill. We have randomized trials in all three groups of people. That's our highest level of evidence. And in those randomized trials, it was not effective. If anything, it may be harmful. So people should <laughs> stop trying to take that. It's not a badge of honor. It doesn't make you a Republican. It does, there's nothing good about taking that. It, um, you know, we, we bought a lot of it for our national stockpile. Uh, we should just you know, give it back to the drug makers or whatever, or save it for if we ever have malaria. But um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a useful drug. So I'm, that, hearing, I'm hearing from a bunch of doctors who feel like they're getting good results with it. And it's really hard to argue with a doctor who is getting, giving a drug to patients and the patients are coming back and say, doc, I feel great. And I remember like when you started your career, like this was the big thing that you were looking at was disparities in standards of care and, and how, how people could be deluding themselves. Do you have a sense of... Like I know, you know, I know some like smart doctors, and I'm I'm sad to say a lot of doctors in the plant-based community are very like you know just you know eat your veggies and you'll be mostly immune. And these you know the pharmaceutical companies are evil, and so they're trying to keep this cheap drug out so they can make tons of money on their proprietary expensive drugs. Yeah. Do you have a, do you have a sense of um, where the hydroxychloroquine cheerleading comes from from within the medical profession and so it doesn't it doesn't come from 
you know, real scientists in the medical profession. It comes from people who say, I can't argue with what I see with my own eyes. And, you know, if you go back in the history of medicine, the people who used leeches and who did bleeding, the doctors who killed George Washington and the doctors who killed uh, President Garfield, they didn't think that what they were doing was stupid. Right. I mean, and we kept those things for, you know, hundreds or thousands of years, not because, you know, the, the people were like obsessed with magic. It, they appeared to work. You put leeches on people and they got better. And you say, oh, that's amazing. The leeches work. They turned around immediately after we put the leeches on. Then you put the leeches on and they don't get better. And you say, oh, they were really sick. You know, they were beyond our help because even the leeches didn't help them, you know? And that's exactly the same thing that happens now. You have a very variable illness. Some people have very mild cases. Like I said, 40% of people have no symptoms at all. And then there's a lot of people who have mild cases. And then we have these people who have very severe illness and a small percentage of people who die. Um, and so this is, you know, it, it's not a disease where at the level of an individual physician, they can tell what works and what doesn't. Um, because if they give hydroxychloroquine to somebody and they end up in the hospital on a ventilator, they'll say, oh, well, that was a really sick one. Of course, you know, it's not going to work for everybody. Well, look how many people it did work for. Well, look how many people not doing anything works for. Um, and, and that's the problem. You know, we, we learned a long time ago that we need science, we need, you know, um, we need studies where we actually observe every single patient and where we do randomized trials to be able to actually tell what is the cause of the disease. Um, and we actually have a ton of randomized trials underway or finishing. So there were lots of randomized trials of hydroxychloroquine. And so before we had those, we couldn't say definitively whether it worked or not. Now we can say definitively that it does not work and people should not use it. Because mm -hmm. one, one of the things I saw was there were two studies, I think, I, I can't remember if it was Duke or UNC, that were retracted because mm -hmm. of um, hanky-panky, and those were the two, like, the two first anti-hydroxychloroquine trials. Again, those were, those were not randomized trials. Those were observational studies. Okay. And so observational studies means we just look at people who got it and people who didn't get it. Right. But it's not random who gets it and who doesn't get it. And, you know, you may not give it to people who look so sick that they're going to die. You just say nothing's going to help them. I'm not going to bother. Whereas you might give it to people who are a little less sick, who look like they might recover and you want to try to help them recover. Um, so and it may be that the, the places that are the most cutting edge are using everything, you know, and and they're also doing a better job with their ventilators and what it, you, you just can't tell from from observational studies. They can really lead you astray. Um, and in this case, I think, you know, they did. But, but the randomized trials have all been the same and they've all shown that there is no effectiveness. So we can, we can confidently put it out of our minds. And that's why you know, the CDC has said it, um, the NIH has said it, you know, they don't come out and, and give those kinds of, uh, and the FDA, you know, retracted the, the approval. Um, the FDA giving approval in the first place, I think, was kind of sketchy. Um, and certainly there would have been a lot of political pressure on them not to retract it. Um, but they did retract it because that's their job. Glad to see them do that. So, um, yeah, that, just put that out of your mind. You know, it's like you've seen the birth certificate. He was born in the United States. Let's stop arguing about it. Right? <laughs> Okay. Um, what, what about other, other, other drugs? Um, there's like the res thing I can't pronounce. Yeah, so, and... so remdesivir was, was used in randomized trials and it is effective in sort of shortening the hospitalization. It, it didn't get to the point where, it, you know, there weren't enough patients for it to show that it, it reduced mortality at all, but that is now the standard of care. Mm -hmm. um, it's very expensive. Um, I think it's like $2,500 for a five day course. Um, but, you know, when people are in the hospital in the ICU, that's, you know, probably less than one day in the ICU. So if it shortens the course, it's probably saving us money. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
So, you know, that's an antiviral drug. Um, the thing that was a real uh, winner was um, dexamethasone. So that's a steroid. And, um, you know, it, so I should backtrack and sort of say, what is, what is going on with COVID? Why do people die? Um, and the, it seems like this is uh, the immune system gets totally out of whack for some people. And there's a, there's a overreaction to the virus, in what's called cytokine storm, where basically the, the, the immune system ends up attacking everything, not just the virus, but um, you know, all the tissues around it. And, and that can be really devastating to various organs. So um, the, uh, the dexamethasone is actually a steroid that, that calms the immune system down. Um, and that's turned out to be quite effective. Um, in reducing mortality. And there are several randomized trials that's shown that that's effective. And so that's now the standard of care pretty much everywhere. That's an extremely inexpensive drug. Um, but that's only for people who are very sick. It's not gonna make any difference for people who are at home, who are not in the hospital yet. And it hasn't been shown to work for people who are not on a ventilator yet. So you've gotta be really sick before that's gonna make a difference. But it does make a difference in terms of mortality. And I think the mortality has come down somewhat um, you know, since, since the beginning of the pandemic. We have a much better understanding of how to um, give supportive care for this uh, and then uh, you know, some of the drugs that we can use to treat it. Um, so it's not quite as fatal as it was, but it's still you know, a lot of people getting very sick uh, long courses in the uh, intensive care unit and still pretty high mortality rate for, you know, this kind of illness. Mm -hmm. So when we talked in March, we, the, the cytokine storm was one of the theories. So that has, the scientific understanding has kind of coalesced, like that's the, the mechanism by which it attacks the body? Yeah, again, it's, it's not attacking the body. The body is overreacting to the virus, and that's probably seems to be what's causing the uh, <clears throat> You know, uh -huh. and, and we've never been good at treating that anyway. I mean, that's a lot of what happens in sepsis. Um, and, you know, we, this, is, this is an ongoing problem in terms of uh, infectious disease. We don't have a great understanding of how the immune system works. Mm -hmm. uh, does, this, does the fact that the steroid that, um, what, does it boost the immune system or weaken the immune system or modulate or create more intelligence in it? Do we have any idea? Uh, I mean, it, I, I would say it modulates it, but it basically tends to, you know, to, to tamp down the immune system. It, it, it kind of like it, weaken isn't quite the right word, but I, I mean, it does sort of have that effect. If you give people steroids in general, it makes them more susceptible to various kinds of infections. Mm -hmm. um, and so to that extent, it's sort of weakening the immune system, but it's, it's really more, it's, it's just kind of like turning down the volume. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's because there was a lot of talk, you know, in my community and the, you know, take responsibility for your health community around, we have to strengthen our immune system. Are yeah. Do, or like, is it like you strengthen it before you get it? So you don't get it, but once you get it. Like, well, having a strong immune system and having an overreactive immune system are not really, I don't think they're related to each other. I mean, if you look at the kinds mm -hmm. of people who are having these overreactive immune systems, they're not healthy people to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. We know that the sicker you are before you get it, the worse your outcomes are. So the people who have the most comorbidities, particularly people who have obesity um, and diabetes seem to do really poorly with this disease. So um, that isn't to say that just because you're healthy beforehand, you don't have to worry about it. Um, it's just that the risk is much smaller to people who are younger Younger people have better immune systems, um, and to people who have no comorbidities. Gotcha. Um, uh, let's. Um, we talked about masks. What about social distancing? Is is six feet still the number? Does it matter if we're wearing masks? Yeah. So, um, being far away from. So, so if you think about how the virus is actually spreading through the air. Um, Distance is your friend. Um, fresh air is your friend. Breezes are your friend. So if you think about the amount of virus 
that is concentrated in the air, and that's the aerosols. So, so you have two different um, ways that the virus could spread, right? One is through droplets. Droplets are big uh, droplets uh -huh. of, of, of liquid, right? And so they're coming out of, like if you cough, you release a lot of droplets uh, and they can go quite a distance. Uh, if you sneeze, it's even worse. All right. So this is like um, you're you're in the first row of the theater, and the actors are like spraying, to, yeah, to enunciate. Um, so, but but if a person coughs, um, it, the virus is going to go out. The droplets generally will start to settle uh, within some distance of the person, mm -hmm. and typically six feet is enough for the for the droplets to settle. Aerosols are tiny, tiny drops, and they're suspended in the air, and they can actually linger there for, for uh, even for hours. And so if you have a person who's breathing in a room, they're going to have a lot of aerosol go up into the room. And talking creates more aerosols. Singing seems to create a particularly large number of aerosols. So, um, that's why you know if you there there was a choir practice in uh, Seattle early on in the uh, early on in the pandemic, which was a sort of a super spreader event, where everybody in the choir practice was maintaining the distance from each other, but they were all in an enclosed room, and so all of these people singing for about two hours, and one of the people was infected, and as a result, almost everybody who was in that room got infected. Um, so, and that's one of the reasons that sort of religious services are such a uh, common source of spreading. If you take, you know, a couple hundred people and put them together in a room and then they all sing and they stay there for, you know, an hour or two, um, there's going to be a very high probability of people being infected. Um, and so, you know, uh, you don't have to be anti-religion to say that it's not a good idea for people to gather indoors and to be singing or you know or speaking or whatever for uh, a long period of time now that isn't to say that religion is a dangerous thing or people getting together to worship is a dangerous thing and if people are getting together to worship outdoors and they're wearing masks those two things together i mean the the need when you're outside for masks is much much less um you know, if you're walking with somebody, um, even if you're a couple of feet apart, you know, the, the, uh, the, the aerosols that you're creating are going up into the air and then they're being diluted very rapidly, you know, especially if there's like a little bit of a breeze blowing, anything that's gonna, that's gonna dissipate the uh, viral particles. So you're not gonna get infected by by inhaling one viral particle. You have, there's some sort of minimum dose that you have to get. We don't know exactly what that is. But the more time you spend in contact with somebody, the closer the contact you are, and the more contained the air is, the more dangerous it is. So uh, there's very little outdoor spread of the virus. Now, if you had a lot of people who were packed together uh, in an outdoor space, and there was very little airflow, um, then you say, might say, say, uh, uh, a motorcycle rally. I, again, you know how close they are together. If there, if there's a bunch of people on motorcycles, and you know, typically people in a motorcycle, you know, the motorcycles don't get that close to each other. Right. Uh, and and if there's a little bit of a breeze blowing and whatever, there's probably very little risk to that. It's it's what happens in the evening when the people decide to go into the bar. Mm -hmm. um, and now you've got, you know, 100 people packed indoors. Uh, and I totally don't understand our attachment to bars. I don't know why we need to have bars open. Um, you know, that, that to me sort of makes no sense. But again, it's not the alcohol. Like if people are sitting in, in outdoor spaces and they're being served mm -hmm. alcohol in outdoor spaces, not a problem. But if they're going to be indoors, um, that's yeah. where you know, it's, it's all about the ventilation. Well, I think there's a lot of laws around the country against drinking alcohol outdoors. Um, not on private property, though. Right. So if it's a you know if it's a bar that's got an outdoor area, outdoor seating area, I think that's fine. But I guess you know a lot of bars don't have, and just like restaurants, 
they don't have enough outdoor space to really be um, sustainable. Um, but I think that's a, that's a sacrifice that our country could make without a huge impact on our economy. Um, and the benefits would be so great in terms of, you know, being able to get the kids back to school and, um, you know, being able to get people working in, in so many other places. Mm. Do you think that's, that's kind of the trade-off, bars versus schools to some degree? I mean, it's, it's bars, it's, it's probably uh, churches, it's, you know, it's the places that people gather in large numbers. Mm -hmm. um, to me, restaurants don't feel safe at all. The idea that you're going to cut a restaurant's uh, capacity by 50% and have people sitting six feet apart, that doesn't feel safe to me. Uh, because the, the air in the restaurant, you know, there just isn't enough airflow in the restaurant, the ventilation. We really need to be paying a lot of attention to ventilation. Um, mm -hmm. And as far as I know, we're, we're not really. Um, Gotcha. So when, um, what that brings up for me is about, you know, schools reopening. There's been a lot of debate about whether kids can get it, whether they can spread it, who they can spread it to. What do we know? Um, kids can definitely get it. Kids can definitely spread it, um, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, there, there are a lot of kids in school. I mean, school is really important, you know, and, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a daughter who's still in, in high school and, um, you know, being home is not great. Uh, you know, the, the social interactions uh, are really important at that age and learning virtually just doesn't work for a lot of kids. Plus, you know, there are a lot of people who, um, you know, who don't have access to the tools to be able to have Zoom classrooms from their homes and whatnot. So I, I think it's, you know, it's really a, a tragedy to have the schools closed. On the other hand, you know, we are not in a position to be able to send kids back to school without having a huge number of cases, not just among the students, but, you know, their families, the teachers, the coaches, the, all the other people that they come in contact with. You know, we, we have just, compared to other countries, we're a disaster. You know, we are just an unmitigated disaster. Um, and, you know, I, the, the, the data are all out there for people to look at. You know, it's not like it's hard to interpret it yourself. So what, what, what does the data say about when we compare ourselves to other countries? You know, I've heard people say, well, New Zealand is an outlier because they're an island. Sweden, like we should, you know, Sweden, we thought they were doing terribly, but it looks like they've come through better than others because they kind of front loaded deaths. What's, what's your sense of the truth of these um, country comparisons? Uh, the truth of the country comparisons, and you don't have to take it from me, you can go like the New York Times has a thing where you can follow the different things or Hopkins has a, you know, a website where you can actually see the, the worldwide numbers. Um, you know, the only countries that are sort of comparably bad are, um, you know, Iran, Russia, and Brazil, I think, you know, I mean, that, that's the company that we're in. Um, we, every country in Europe, including Italy that got, you know, blindsided because they were the first and Spain, all those countries are doing so much better than us. Germany is way ahead of us. Um, and all the Scandinavian countries and Sweden, you know, uh, they did worse than all the other Scandinavian countries. Uh, and I think there's, there's some misinterpretation of you know, what Sweden try, you know, was trying to do. They did implement social distancing. They do wear masks. It's just that they didn't shut down all their businesses and have everybody stay home. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, their economy didn't do so much better than all the other economies in, in Scandinavia. So uh, there was a real misinterpretation of what the Swedes were doing. The idea that, that they were trying to get herd immunity by having all the young people go out and get it and have all the old people stay home, was, that was not accurate. Gotcha. Uh, so New Zealand seems to have like done really well. And I just read there were like four cases in Auckland and they shut things down again. Is like, and that makes me think like, what is there an end game? Like, is, you know, as soon as like, are we just going to have to wear masks and social distance and stay home and like become hunter gatherers and, you know, small hearted culturalists forever? Because as, as, you know, as soon as New Zealand relaxes things, it gets it it pops up again. Like what what 
What do we yeah, know this, about immunity, I mean, herd immunity? Until, until we have a vaccine, we are not going to be able to go back to anything like normal life. And we are not going to be like New Zealand because we are, you know, we are the United States. And I, I remember when I saw this, you know, back in February or January, when, when this outbreak started in China, and I saw what the Chinese had to do in order to, uh, you know, to, to stop the, uh, the outbreak in, in Wuhan, and that they basically just closed down the entire province, and they didn't let people leave their homes. Um, and they took people and, and they put them, you know, who had left the province, and they sent them back and made them stay there. Um, and I realized, like, if that's what it takes to get a hold on this virus, we are screwed because, you know, we don't have any of those kind of tools in the United States. Um, and not only that, we've got all this ignorance. And I didn't realize how bad the ignorance was going to be and, and how this would evolve into some kind of political thing. Um, but it's been just a disaster. It's an absolute unmitigated disaster. And, uh, you know, we've never had anything like it in terms of, uh, well, I don't know that that's true. So I've read some things recently about what was happening in, in you know, with the, with the, uh, with the uh, influenza pandemic that we had back in 1918, and that there actually were sort of similar um, revolts against mask wearing and stuff back then. So maybe this is just who we are as a people, but you know, that it, it certainly, you know, the New Zealanders pulled together in a way that we did it. Um, and it really comes from leadership. They, they had faith in their prime minister. They followed what she said. She worked with the scientists. They really all pulled together and they were able to, you know, to really stamp it out. They have the advantage of being able to limit who comes in and out of their country uh, much more than, than we can, but that's totally irrelevant now because, you know, now, now the CDC says that it's okay for us to travel to, uh, you know, a bunch of countries that won't let us in, that won't let us in. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that that the president is going to strengthen the border uh, with Mexico when you know the Mexicans should probably be afraid of Americans coming in because all of our states on the border have so many cases. Um, you know, so we're not anywhere near any sort of end game, and the vaccine is going to be interesting. Um, you know, there are a lot, a lot of vaccine trials going on right now. There are, um, I believe there are seven vaccines in, that are in phase three. Um, so we're very likely to have a vaccine, uh, you know, within a year of when the, uh, when the virus first broke out. So, you know, sometime early 2021, we'll almost certainly have, you know, one or more vaccines, uh, mm -hmm. which is, you know, remarkable. Like we've never had anything like that in terms of the speed. Um, and that's just a testament um, to the technologies that we've developed, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. the, the, the more complicated part is one, uh, scaling that up to produce the hundreds of billions of doses that we're gonna need worldwide, hundreds of millions of doses in the United States. That's gonna be step one. And, Step two, which may be even a bigger challenge, is going to be convincing people to get vaccinated because there are going to be people who are going to read on Facebook and Twitter and whatever that the vaccine is harmful or dangerous or that COVID isn't that bad. But this is a, you know, this is a ploy from the drug manufacturers, you know, and I actually looked at, you know, they keep announcing that the government, you know, has made deals with different vaccine makers. Um, to buy 100 million doses here and 200 million doses there. And you look at how much the government actually spent to buy these doses, and it's, it's actually pretty reasonable. I mean, um, you know, the, the, it's somewhere between $15 and $20 a dose, uh, which is kind of on the, you know, with where you, what you might be with like a flu vaccine or something like that. Um, you know, it's not like, shingles vaccine which is like two hundred dollars a dose uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the you know vaccines that have been recently developed are, are in that 150 to 200 dollars a dose so you know here's a potentially life-saving vaccine something that we totally need to be able to get anywhere back to normal um 
but I don't know how many people are going to take it, and that's going to be a problem. Mm. So I have some questions about vaccines because I'm, you know, in general, I'm not a huge fan of the U.S. approach, which is, you know, seems much more aggressive than most other countries. Um, would you take a vaccine that was like per, before the election, <laughs> like th that seemed like it was a, you know, Trump is wants to have a, you know, October surprise? So I, I don't, I don't see how we would possibly have you know, data back by October that would allow us, you know, I think that the FDA is going to go through the same process that they usually go through um, to review all the data to make sure that the vaccine is safe. Um, you know, if we had a vaccine and then they, they vaccinated everybody and after, you know, 10 million people were vaccinated, it turned out that um, there was actually some kind of really horrible side effect and uh, a lot of healthy people started, uh, you know, to have some kind of liver failure, kidney failure, or I don't know, whatever it was that came from this vaccine, that the, the pushback on the government would be tremendous. So I think that they're, you know, I think they're going to be really careful about it. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the movement to get the, the trials up and running and they, they didn't have any trouble getting volunteers for all the randomized trials, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if they enrolled 30,000 people, 100,000 people, but they they got volunteers right away because there's so many people who want to get the vaccine. Um, so no, I'm not worried that, um, that there's anything wrong with the process. And again, I don't think that the money that's involved is, is outrageous. It seems like a pretty reasonably priced vaccine for what it is. Um, and I think the problem is going to, you know, be getting people to agree to vaccines. I mean, vaccines have been really amazing in terms of what they have brought us. It's probably one of the most powerful things that we've gotten from science. Um, if you look at, you know, what it was like to grow up in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s versus now, you know, we just take it for granted that all of our children will make it to adulthood. We just absolutely take that for granted. And that was not the case. Um, you know, and we don't have the fear of polio and the, the fear of, uh, you know, children dying from, from uh, measles and from smallpox. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just a different world. Um, and vaccines have made so much of a difference in, in uh, you know, in terms of, of, of us making adulthood and, and then um, the newer vaccines, which are really interesting, like the cervical cancer vaccine, um, you know, really reduced the rate of HPV spread and uh, should probably wipe out cervical cancer. Gotcha. Um, what about actual immunity after you've recovered? Um, when we talked last time, you were hopeful that once we identify, we start testing and we identify, we could have people who just go anywhere in the community. I've also seen some studies, I don't think they've been peer reviewed, that antibodies seem to start declining within a month. So, um, yeah, that's sort of been under, um, I don't know, if, uh, understudied, I guess, you know? Because now we have quite a lot of people who have recovered. Um, and we haven't tried sort of sending them into high risk, um, you know, situations in order to see how immune they are. Mm -hmm. um, so we really don't know. But I'm not really aware of any documented cases of somebody who had the disease, recovered, and then caught it again. Um, part of that might be that, you know, it's still relatively rare for people to come down with this, given, you know, how many cases there have been. Um, you know, so if you say that there, there have been 5 million cases in the United States, and probably for every case, there are probably 10 cases. In every case that has been diagnosed, there may be nine other cases that were not diagnosed. So maybe 50 million people in the United States have had this by now. Um, that's really only like 15% of the population. Mm -hmm. So we're nowhere near getting anywhere near herd immunity, you know, which would probably require upwards of 70% of the population to have had the disease. And I don't think that we have any um, stomach for, for trying to, you know, have five times as many deaths as we've already experienced. 
in order to get to herd immunity. So I think that's sort of off the table. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think we can, we can handle, you know, half a million or more Americans uh, dead from this disease to get herd immunity. But um, I think that, uh, you know, most diseases, once you get them, most viral diseases, once you get them, you don't get them again. Um, and so I would be really surprised if people who had gotten the illness, had recovered, were susceptible. Um, antibodies are not, you know, they in and of themselves are not um, great markers of whether you're immune, um, which is to say, if your antibody titers go down, uh, and, and even if they're not detectable, that doesn't mean that you are still susceptible to that disease. So, you know, people who, um, you know, who had chickenpox as a child, for example, often don't have measurable titers. But we don't we don't go ahead and um, and test those people. We don't go and measure people's uh, antibodies against measles to try to figure out if they're immune to measles or not. We just assume that everybody who is vaccinated against measles is immune to measles. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that's probably the case for this. Now it may be that ten or twenty years from now, those people will be susceptible again. Um, you know, people's immune responses can wane over time, and you could be susceptible again, or the virus could mutate, which we don't have any evidence that it's doing that yet. But um, you know, and, and then you could be susceptible to a new form of the virus. Gotcha. But. I think that it's going to be like other viruses. It's not like HIV where people never develop immunity. They get antibodies, but they never develop immunity because that virus is mutating so fast that the antibodies are not effective. Gotcha. So a couple, couple more questions. Mm -hmm. um, last time we talked, you were almost literally in shock at the incompetence <laughs> of the response uh, that yep. the, C, you know, the CDC was able to process just a few hundred tests a day and it was taking weeks. What's the current state of, of our response in terms of treatment, testing, protective equipment? What are, what are front line, you know, real frontline doctors, not those people doing a, a photo op? And, uh, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm even more in shock now right because we've had so much time to solve these problems and it's just been an epic fail um so in terms of testing we have lots and lots of tests but we don't have the rapid kind of turnaround that you need to be able to actually manage the the pandemic using the tests so like we have um you know in our area um, if you are like the, the if, if you have symptoms and you are a high risk patient, you can get tested and get your results back within about 24 hours. If you are a healthcare worker, you can get tested and get your results back within 24 hours. For pretty much everybody else, you're looking at five to seven days uh, before you're going to get your test results back, which just is not. That, that's just not useful, you know? And, um, and we, need, we need everyone to be able to get tests within, you know, with, within 24 hours. And even better are point of care tests where you can get the results right away. Um, and we have just been so slow to develop those and to test them and to get them approved. And I don't, I don't really understand why that is. Um, you know, because you can imagine if you could test uh, people before they went to school or if you could test them before every game or whatever, that, that you could do a lot of things where you wouldn't have to worry so much. Temperature mm -hmm. checks are a very poor way to try to identify who might have the infection and be able to spread. I know that they're working on saliva tests. I've heard that they've been working on saliva tests for months and months and months. They always seem to be just around the corner. Maybe now they're just around the corner, but you know, it, it I don't understand why this has taken so long. I haven't heard a good explanation. Gotcha. So um, the other thing I want to talk to you about is, so in my world, everyone picks a side. And the people that I see, you know, the people who are loudest, who are sort of braying on Facebook and Twitter, 
even you know doctors and, and epidemiologists and you know, I studied epidemiology in, college, in in graduate school, and I can't understand the level of epidemiology that they're talking about, right? With with the the concepts and Bayesian analysis and graph, like I just never took that level. And but I see people in you know who are publicly debating this, and it really feels like a a parade of confirmation bias, where somebody made a statement, where it's you know like John Ioannidis. I think it's yeah. at, at Stanford has been saying, and no matter what happens, he's going to stick to it. And the people who are arguing with him are still arguing with him. Is that, do you see that in the medic, in like the, you know, behind the scenes? Are people, are, are the actual scientists more inquisitive and humble and collegial? Or is there, is there still all this sort of pathological psychology? Um. Well, I haven't heard from him since, you know, since he made his statement sort of early on. I think there are a lot of people who, I mean, he, he's not really an epidemiologist in an infectious disease sense. You know, he's, he's really good statistician, epidemiologist in terms of, you know, understanding observational data and randomized trials. And, you know, he's, he's a very smart guy. Um, I think he strayed a little bit outside his field in this particular instance. Um, and, you know, early on, I was kind of like tracking the cases in Ohio and sort of, you know, basing, you know, on past trends, what the prediction was. Of what, and that didn't yeah, work. We were, yeah, right? we, were, we were thinking, uh, you know, we'd have a, we'd be down to zero by mid-April. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we're not going to be down to zero for years, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, the people that really know this stuff, I don't think that there's a lot of debate about it. Um, you know, the, the, the real infectious disease epidemiologists, I think that they've had a pretty consistent message throughout this. Um, I think that their advice early on about social distancing and whatever was correct. Um, I think that they underestimated the, um, the aerosol issue and, and uh, you know, the, that spread. Um, and, um, but I don't think that there's much debate about that now. I don't think there are, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised sometimes by how long it takes for certain official bodies to come out and say stuff that seems like everybody knew it for a long time. So like when the WHO came out and said that there was aerosolized spray, spread, that seemed like it was already like a couple of months after everybody knew it already. Mm -hmm. uh, or that they said that they're asymptomatic carriers long after everybody knew that. So, um, but I haven't seen a lot of reversals on pretty much anything that, that, you know, was coming out of the mainstream after like April. Um, so I think in, in the beginning in, you know, February, March, um, there was a lot of people trying to understand what was going on. Um, and it was complicated because you know, the models are making predictions based on the current situation and you don't know whether the future situation is gonna be like the current situation. You don't know how people are gonna behave. Mm. Uh, so you could apply the same model to Europe as the United States and, uh, you know, it works one way in Europe and a different way in the United States and that's entirely based on the behaviors of the people in those, in those different regions. Um, so I, I don't see really, I mean, I guess I'm not following the same um, media that you're following, but I don't really see much um, conflict. I, I think that people are pretty much, um, you know, the United States has shown exactly what happens when you don't follow the advice that has been given all along. Um, so, you know, there was this Israeli mathematician who sort of said, look, you know, all of these epidemics follow the same pattern and they all die out after X number of days, no matter what you do, that's clearly not the case. The United States has proven that that's clearly not the case. This can go on for months and months and months. You know, everybody else has this peak and then a, a rapid drop off and a long tail and we have a peak and then a rapid drop off and then a plateau that just goes on forever. Um, yeah, sad. 
That's good. So I want to close with a question that I got from uh, from a listener who wants to know, are we in a situation where the only thing we can do is isolate and wait for a new administration? It says, in the current environment, without a clearly communicated national approach, it doesn't appear that there's anything that we as individuals can do to start moving society in a more informed direction. So do you think we're just, all we can do is sort of take care of our of ourselves and our own? Or are there, is there ways that we can affect societal change? Well, I, I think that we can try to educate the people around us and then they can, edu you know, the more we can spread out the education and get people to believe the truth, um, the more likely we are to actually be able to be successful. I mean, the, the level of ignorance in this country is kind of unbelievable. Um, you know, it's just really hard to, to you know, that, that people could believe the things that they believe. Um, and so, you know, they're most likely to listen to people that they trust, um, which could be people in their family and, um, you know, and, and so we can all try to, um, you know, to impact the people around us. And I think um, just based on some research that we did, um, what we found is that, that uh, in terms of like behaviors, people in their, in their 60s and 70s have been quite compliant with, um, you know, what the, the uh, sort of uh, national um, guidelines for what to do. They've been really good with the social distancing. They're the people that you see walking around with masks outside by themselves, you know, <laughs> it, to a level that I think is, you know, unnecessary. It's like overkill, but, but that's, they've really taken it to heart. It's the young people who are, who are the problem right now. It's the people in their 20s and 30s um, who, you know, consider themselves to be at low risk and who just, you know, really don't want to um, believe that, that they could be putting anyone else at risk. And they're the ones who've, uh, you know, for the most part, changed their behavior so that they're, you know, uh, getting together in large groups and and whatnot. But I think it's just really important for us to try to educate the people around us. Um, and some of that may end up getting into, um, you know, uncomfortable situations and probably shouldn't push it to, to the point of, uh, you know, getting into fistfights or name calling or whatever. But, um, you know, pointing out to people that I'm wearing this mask to protect you. I would like you to do the same to protect me. Um, mm -hmm. And um, that's that's so hard, for, you know, from a behavioral psychology standpoint, because, you know, in the vegan community, we're not very good at just, uh, you know, defending our own pers perspective. Like, you know, if you eat bacon, it doesn't hurt me. <laughs> And, and still, I don't know how to not like, get into it with you about bacon. And I'm, you know, and, and you're going to feel judged and defensive and you're going to feel like I'm a, you know, an asshole do-gooder. And yeah. if, if I actually want to change your behavior because you're being selfish and putting me at risk, it seems really hard to have yeah. those conversations. Right. Well, I think that like if you were a vegan, but you loved meat, and you were being a vegan because you were concerned about global warming. Mm. And, and you said, look, I gave this up and it's really hard, but I did it because I want you to be protected. I want the planet to stay, you know, to, to have a, a, a climate that we can all live in. I'm not doing it to protect my climate. I'm doing it to protect our climate. Mm. Um, you know, that would be a little bit more um, palatable. If, if people understood that, you know, you're not doing it out of your own selfishness, you're doing it out of a, you know, as a sacrifice to help other people. Um, but you're right. I mean, th there is a certain, um, there's a certain way that, that people act where they feel that they're better than other people and they're educating them to, you know, in a, in a way that's kind of looking down on them and people resent that. Um, and so if you're going to do it from a superiority thing, that's a problem. If you say, look, you know, I'm, I hate wearing this mask, it's mm. like totally uncomfortable, but I have to do it. And, and here, you know, I don't want to, 
you know, risk infecting any of the employees here in this store. And so, you know, but it seems to me like, I don't know what it is in, you know, various parts of the country, but certainly in, um, you know, in stores and stuff, I've seen people wearing masks a lot more. Um, and I'm sort of choosing the, the, uh, the stores and restaurants and whatnot that I'll walk into now sort of based on, uh, you know, what their policies are and how well they, you know, everybody's got a sign up that says you got to wear a mask, um, at least in Ohio, but that doesn't mean that the, the employees are actually wearing masks. Um, so I'm, I'm using that as a kind of a litmus test that, you know, do I want to walk into this establishment? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think a lot of the national chains have done a great job, you know, Costco and um, supermarkets and whatnot, I think have been really good um, about, you know, everything. All right. Of course, in North Carolina, employees are likely to get shot if they, if they try to make someone wear a mask. Yeah. Oh, you know, certainly, I, you know, don't, don't, <laughs> don't go up to anyone who might be carrying a gun for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, um, on that note, so, uh, thanks for, for continuing to come on and, uh, and educate and provide, uh, you know, sanity and, and rationality for all the confused people like me. And, uh, yeah. thank you for keeping me connected to the world of crazy. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, yeah, you're you're in Ohio, right? And uh, you have one of the the few Republican governors who seems to be taking this seriously. Yeah, yeah, he spends a lot of time talking to people. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I wish I could see our cases going down more. But uh, and I, I, you know, here I'm going to get negative again. But I worry as we go into the fall, when it starts getting cold and people can't meet each other outside anymore, it's either going to be very lonely. Mm. Uh, or people are going to, you know, do things that they shouldn't do. All right. Well, we're, we're, we're in this for the long haul, it looks like. So, uh, you know, maybe the, the vaccine will come. Maybe they'll have a, uh, a, a, f a forehead test <laughs> and uh, we can start going back to normal. Yeah. Technology will save us. All right. As always. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks a lot. Take care, Ali. Okay. Bye.